Having finished the brainstem and having finished the diencephalon, we're now ready to dive into the cerebrum, the so-called seat of intelligence, where all that complicated stuff is your memories, your emotions, your personality, all of your thinking, well, the very little amount of thinking that you do anyway. Um, let's start with kind of an interesting historical note that is actually relevant. Um, phrenology. Phrenology was a ridiculous form of pseudoscience developed in the early 19th century by German physician Franz Joseph Gall. And according to phrenology, the contour of the skull could predict personality traits and other mental qualities. And I'm sure you've seen these before. They, they actually sell one. I've got one. Somebody gave it to me as a present. Like it looks like a, a sort of a bust. It's a big, you know, ceramic uh, thing about, you know, two feet high and it shows a head and all the parts of the head are divided up according to as you can see if you look carefully at the diagram you know veneration oh my gosh all these old-fashioned words um, locality what uh, I can't even read them <clears throat> it's so small sublimity um, in other words the the different parts on your head corresponded to different personality traits and other mental abilities um, it was not supported by any empirical evidence. It was just complete nonsense, like, you know, the world is so full of right now. Um, however, phrenology did foreshadow the idea that there were specific functional areas of the brain. So phrenology itself was kind of stupid, but in a way it may have led to the idea that the brain was not just one giant mass of goop, that, you know, everything was done by every part of the brain. It, it may have helped lead to the idea that different parts of the brains have specific different functions, as we've been seeing all the way along. So, phrenology did have some unfortunate applications in society. It was used to promote racism. Uh, supposedly, you know, people of different color had, you know, bumps on their head that showed that they were stupid, and oh my god, it was just horrific stuff. Also, like, People were said to be mentally retarded or mentally ill based on the bumps they had on their skull. You can see there in the bottom where there's the masculine head and face and the feminine head and face. Oh, God. You know, humans just always want to find a way to <clears throat> make fun of other people and think of themselves as superior. And, of course, phrenology came to be used in that sense as well. But, fortunately, what came next was Corbinian Broadman. 1909 German anatomist um, constructed a cytoarchitectural map of the cerebral cortex. So cytoarchitectural. Literally what he did is he just took chunks of brain <clears throat> of cerebral cortex, looked, them, looked at them under microscopes to look at the actual cell structure and discovered that different parts of the cerebral cortex had very different organizations than other parts did. And he didn't know anything about what different parts of the brain did he just said, I'm going to map them purely according to their structure, to their um, cell structure. And he started doing that, and he then would number them as he did it. These are all, this is a histological study, right? Just the, the outline, the layout of the cells. He found 52 distinct areas, and he, he mapped them very carefully. Well, as it turns out, a lot of them really did, unlike phrenology, a lot of them turned out to correspond pretty directly with brain function. So um, this was a, a huge advancement in science. Somebody just painstaking stuff. Oh my God, looking for hours under a microscope at different parts of the brain and just simply mapping how they looked different, how they were organized differently. And it turned out to be a huge benefit to science. Um, Broadman numbers are still used today. As a matter of fact, we're going to be using them over the next few slides. He also did this um, with uh, other, uh, other primates, like monkeys and stuff. Um, and there were a lot of similarities. Differences as well, but a lot of similarities. Like that primate right there, do you know? That's, that's one of your cousins right there. A the little guy on the lower left. That's a lemur. Lemurs are smart. Lemurs have big brains like we do, and they're organized in a lot the same way, so... Animals are smart, okay? Don't ever think they're not. Okay, let's look at the cerebral cortex. It embodies the conscious mind. It's where you're thinking. It's where you have self-awareness right now, where you're daydreaming, all right? Where you're thinking all those dirty thoughts. Um, it's the outermost portion of the cerebrum. 
generally composed of six layers, total of two to five millimeters thick. So two to five millimeters, remember, that's not much at all. Um, you know, the width of my index fingernail is 10 millimeters, so that's half the width of my index fingernail. That's not very thick at all. But six relatively distinct layers, not everywhere. Um, it differs from one part to another, but overall, in general, six layers. That's the kind of thing that Corbinian Broadman was looking at, was the arrangement, the thickness, and so on of those different layers. Cortex in Latin means the bark of the tree. Because the cerebral cortex is very thin, it's basically like an outer layer that's on top of all the white matter. You can almost peel it off like you peel off the bark of a tree. This is entirely gray matter, no tracts. The white matter is underneath. The gray matter is nothing more than cell bodies of neurons along with dendrites and glial cells and so on. All the areas are interconnected by the white matter underneath. All right, The white matter underneath is all the wiring and the cortex is all wired together via the underlying white matter. The convolutions formed by the gyri and sulci increase the total surface area. So in other words, by having it folded up like this, by having all these sulci and gyri, all these little folds, you can pack more cortex into a given amount of space than you could if it was simply smooth and flat. All right? Composed of three types of functional areas, motor, sensory, and association. This goes back to when we first talked about the nervous system. We said this same thing. You've got incoming information, that's sensory. You've got outgoing information, that's motor. And then basically you have to figure out what the sensory information means and then send out motor signals to deal with it. So that's ultimately what everything is. And we're going to be looking at the cerebrum in that way. We're going to be looking at motor areas versus sensory areas versus association areas. So keep those straight, all right? Try to keep the different parts of the cortex straight according to those three big divisions. I think that'll help you remember better and help help you understand better and help keep it clearer, okay? So, generally speaking, each hemisphere of the cerebral cortex deals with contralateral input and output. We talked about this before, the decussation. Motor decussation was in the uh, pyramids, down in the medulla, and the sensory was in the DCML. <clears throat> and so, generally speaking, you know, when you move your right arm, it's the left side of your brain that did that. And when you feel something on your right arm, that sensation is registering on the left side of your brain. Most sensory signals register in the contralateral lobe. Most motor signals originate from the contralateral lobe. That's what I just said, in not as nearly as an elegant a way. Hemispheres are generally symmetrical, but there is some lateralization of function, it's called. In other words, generally speaking, the same things are on both sides, both hemispheres. But there are some functions that are more on one side than on the other side. That's called lateralization. So for example, language areas are typically found only in the left hemisphere. We'll zoom in and talk more about that later. But for most people, language happens only on the left side of the brain. So for example, when someone has a stroke, um, oftentimes, I mean, you don't really hope for things about strokes, but you know, my wife had a stroke um, on the right side of her brain. So fortunately, all of her language capability was um, spared. People who have huge strokes on the left side often lose a lot of language ability. In contrast, right hemisphere more involved in spatial and emotional processing. So, um, yeah, well, we'll just talk more about that coming up. But yeah, in, in particular, spatial stuff, so you know your awareness of where you are, like directions, you know, being good at directions and things. And emotional processing, you know, the emotional um, residue that goes along with thoughts and so on. That seems to be more on the right side. So notice in the diagram below, they show the right side of the brain. They're showing Wernicke's area, understand speech, and Broca's area, production of speech. That's kind of goofy. For most people, those would be on the left side, not the right side. But as we'll see, there are some people for whom it's on the right side. So that lower illustration is it's very atypical. That's showing language areas on the right side, which would not be true for most people. Okay, lateralization of function continue with that. Associated with cerebral dominance. 
So in some senses, one hemisphere can be thought of as being more dominant than the other. So 90% of humans are right-handed. That indicates a left hemisphere cerebral dominance, right? So most kids, from the time they're born, favor either the left hand or the right hand. And 90% favor the right hand. That indicates left hemispheric cerebral dominance. The other 10% either left-handed or ambidextrous. Um, you know, to some extent, you can train these things. And unfortunately, back in old times, there was a stigma associated with being left-handed. And they would often take kids who were clearly left-handed and force them to eat with their right hand and to draw with their right hand and so on. Ringo Starr, the drummer for the Beatles, he talked about this. He's naturally left-handed, but as a little kid, they forced him to do things right-handed. But still, that, that led to his unique drumming style because um, he uses a right-handed drum kit but because he's left-handed, he does things in ways that are a little bit odd compared to most drummers, but that helped give him a signature sound. Ringo's drumming stands out from other drummers because of that, so it ended up being kind of cool for him. Cerebral dominance, by the way, found in many animals besides humans, all right? And you can actually see this inside the fetus. Fetuses clearly will be moving one side more than the other. So it's, it's not something that is just trained or just happens after birth. It's not just your environment. It's clearly something that's there right from the start. Language areas, as I mentioned before, are usually in the left hemisphere. 95% of right-handers are left brain for language. And about 70% of left-handers are also still left brain for language. So notice most people by far, no matter whether you're right or left-handed, you still have your language mostly on the left side, all right? Broca's area, by the way, controls language production. Wernicke's area controls language comprehension. We'll see this again coming up. Again, I'm trying to preview here. Broca's area in the frontal lobe is controlling language production. In other words, when you speak, the production of speech controlled by Broca's area. Wernicke's area, which is kind of at the junction between parietal and temporal, is controlling your ability to understand what you're hearing, okay? We'll come back to that again. Um, at one time, lots of other things were thought to be lateralized. Um, evidence that emotions and spatial perceptions I mentioned before are typically more specialized in the right hemisphere. So some of that is true, but Research has shown that most of the left-right, le right-brain, left-brain stuff in pop psychology has no empirical basis. God, there are all these books you can buy in the self-help section of the bookstore. Of course, nobody goes to bookstores anymore. But talk about, you know, like in the diagram in the lower left. See, the left brain is, that's for language and numbers and analytical. And the right brain is for expression and emotional intelligence and imagination. A lot of that's just garbage. There's, there is some evidence that there is, there is some distinction of some sort, but a lot of it is completely just overblown. We're, we're doing lots of stuff with both sides of our brains. And you get to the diagrams like the one on the lower right. Oh my God, that's just complete garbage. Love is on the left, hate is on the right, happiness is on the left, sadness. That's just, that's just people making shit up. That's, there's no reality there at all. Okay. Let's talk about some motor areas. Remember we said the whole cerebral cortex is either motor or sensory or association. Let's start with motor areas, movement related things. Motor areas, cerebral cortex are found in the frontal lobe, all right? Involved in voluntary movement. So the decision right now as I reach out to pick up a glass to get a drink, um, that was happening um, <clears throat> in the frontal lobe. The primary motor cortex, that's Brodmann area number four. Remember we talked about Corbinian Brodmann mapping out all those areas, the cytoarchitectural map developed just by looking at the differences in the layers, the, the way the cells are laid out, the cell structure. As it turns out, Brodmann area four, and you can see it there on the diagram on the top, that's called the primary motor cortex, located on the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe anterior to the central sulcus. I me we mentioned this before. We saw this a slide before. We saw the precentral gyrus on the anterior, on the frontal lobe side of the central sulcus. This is where 
you think consciously about movement. When I'm thinking about I am going to make a fist with my left hand and then I do it, that was happening in the motor cortex. And which side was that happening on? If I decided to make a fist with my left hand, yeah, that happened on the right side. So the right motor cortex, the precentral gyrus, was where I just thought about making a fist with my left hand. It consists of pyramidal cells which form the upper motor neurons. Remember I mentioned uh, before there are upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons? The lower motor neurons are your spinal cord. I mean your spinal nerves rather going out to the muscles of your body. So these pyramidal cells are the ones that are going to go down and decussate in the pyramids. All right. Now the motor homunculus, homunculus Latin for a little man, represents a somatotopy, a point-to-point -point correspondence with the areas of the body innervated by the contralateral motor fibers of the spinal nerves. Boy, there was a lot in that sentence, wasn't there? Let's try to deconstruct it. So there you see in the diagram, um, you can see the primary motor cortex on the left side, okay? That's where you're consciously thinking about movement. But what happens is, see in the lower right, see that little diagram there? Of um, It's showing the outline of a little human being. Um, that outline is showing that the movement is not just randomly arranged on your motor cortex, on your precentral gyrus. Different parts of your body correspond to specific parts of that. So that's the kind of thing like you see, and there was that, uh, what was it, an Orbit commercial, I think? where the brain surgeon is uh, booking his travel and he's like sticking electrodes into the patient on the table and causing the guy to type on the keyboard. Um, you, you can't really do something quite that sophisticated, but it really is true. Like if you were to stick a court, uh, an electrode into the motor cortex that corresponded to somebody's you know, upper left arm, their upper left arm would actually move, all right? because that's what's going on. Notice that the homunculus, there's a lot of the cortex devoted to the face and to the hands, but hardly any devoted like to your back or like to your thighs. Think about it. You don't make precise movements with your back, so you don't need a whole lot of motor cortex to do that, but you do make precise movements with your hand and with your face. Think about things like talking and facial expressions. We have very precise control over our facial muscles. So that's why the homunculus is not equally represented. Huge parts of the cortex are devoted to our hands and our face. Much smaller parts are devoted to the rest of our body. And so by the way, once again, that correspondence, the fact that there's a certain part of the cortex that corresponds to like your thumb, that's called a somatotopy, a point-to-point -point correspondence between your body and the, um, the precentral gyrus. So continuing with motor areas, the premotor area, now we're on Broadman 6. So once again, look in the diagram on the upper right, you can see 4, that was the primary motor cortex, the precentral gyrus. Now 6, this is the premotor cortex, premotor because it's in front of the motor cortex. Anterior, primary motor cortex, planning and staging area. So again, you know, when I decide I'm going to move my right arm to do something, um, the final command comes from the precentral gyrus. But along the way, there was some, some sequencing, some scheduling, some planning of exactly which muscles are going to move before other muscles. That's happening in the premotor area, all right? Broadman 6. Look at how the brain you know, divides up these functions. It, it has, it's kind of like, that's like the on-deck circle in baseball, you know, um, the uh, pre-central gyrus and motor cortex, that's where you're actually up at the plate swinging at the bat. Um, the pre-motor area, that's when you're in the, in the on-deck circle, you know, swinging the bat, warming up to get up there. So it's a planning area, a staging area, where things are being sequenced just right in order to make the movement you want. Then Broadman area 8, and again you can see it right there in the upper right diagram, illustration, on the frontal eye field. Anterior to the premotor cortex controls voluntary eye movements. So remember the superior and inferior colliculi and the tectum of the midbrain, those were the startle reflex. That's where you like involuntarily oriented to some threatening stimulus in your environment. Here is where, you know, if I decide I am now going to look over to my left and I do it, 
that that sequencing that staging area was the frontal eye field that's where the planning was done for the precise movement of my eyes see isn't it cool look at all these motor areas look how they're all working together let's move on then to sensory areas the primary somatosensory cortex broadened areas one two and three so look again there on the diagram one two and three these are on the post central gyrus they're on the parietal lobe posterior to the central sulcus. This is input from the tactile receptors all over the body, all of our skin senses. So again, pain, pressure, temperature, itch, stretch, all those skin senses are registering here, all right? That's where they all come in. Um, important for tactile spatial discrimination, all right? Um, it's important to know exactly where something is touching you, you know, so you can, you know, scratch it in the right place, okay? You know, somebody's scratching your back, oh no, lower to the left, that's spatial discrimination, okay? And just as there is a motor homunculus, there is a sensory homunculus. That re represents, again, a somatotopy, a point-to-point -point correspondence with the areas of the body represented by the contralateral sensory fibers or spinal nerves. So what that means is when somebody touches a particular part on your right forearm, that's going to register at a very particular location of the left somatosensory cortex, all right? All that stuff is coming and registering a point-to-point -point correspondence with the incoming um, skin senses from everywhere on your body. And once again, notice how um, you have a much, the homunculus is much greater with your face and with your hands. So you have great tactile discrimination on your hands. Like, you know, if somebody um, touches your hand, you have a very clear and distinct immediate memory of exactly where you were touched. Um, they, they do these, um, these little tests called two-point discriminations, where you take, like, imagine taking two paper clips and, and touching a part of the body and having the paper clips start far apart and they get closer and closer and closer and closer together. If you do that on the hand, you can tell that there's still two distinct points even when they get really close together. Same thing on your face. But like on, on the middle of your back, very quickly you can't feel two individual paper clips anymore. It feels like there's just one. All right, That's spatial discrimination. You have very good spatial discrimination on your hands and on your face it's not nearly as good in the rest of your body. Sometimes you get like an itch on your lower leg and it takes a couple, a couple of scratches before you get right where it's itching. That's kind of what's going on. Continuing with sensory areas, so the primary auditory cortex, Broadman areas 41 and 42. So look in the upper illustration there, 41 and 42, right where the sort of orange is coming together with the green, located on the temporal lobe. That receives auditory input from the cochlea. The cochlea is part of your inner ear where sound registers. It's interpreting signals for pitch, loudness, and the locations of sounds. So that's where sound information is going. So notice on the post-central gyrus, that's where the skin senses were going. So now the sound information is going pretty close by down there at Brobman areas 41 and 42. So other incoming sensory cortices, so the gustatory cortex, Broadman area 43, again very close by, located on the insula, receives taste information, that's the gustatory cortex. The olfactory, which is Broadman area 28, All right, can you see 28? Gotta look around for it a little bit. See, it's uh, kind of buried down inside, um, so look in the, kind of the middle diagram there where we're actually looking at insula. So um, that's olfactory information coming in, okay? See how the different parts of the cortex are specialized for different things? And vestibular, not very well defined, that's balance information, but it's still in this general area, all right? Still in this general sensory area. So that took care of the direct motor and sensory areas. Now let's move on to the association areas. So remember, sensory information comes in, then you have to basically process it and think about it, and then finally motor information goes out. So we looked at where the sensory information came in, we looked at where the motor information goes out, 
Now we're really going to look at where all of the thinking take place, the figuring out, the understanding, the, de the decision making, all of that. These are the so-called association areas. They make up most of the cerebral cortex by far, okay? So the somatosensory association area, broad in areas five and seven, so again, look up, they're right by that post-central gyrus again, located on the parietal lobe, integrates information from the primary um, somatosensory cortex, interprets impulses for form and texture. So in other words, the very basic, primitive, simplest signals are coming into that post-central gyrus, but then we use those to make sort of higher level judgments, like, yeah, this is a smooth surface, this is a rough surface. That's an association area. That's where we're actually figuring things out and thinking about them. See, isn't that cool? The original sensory information comes in, and then it moves to a nearby area where we actually think and understand. It allows you to reach into your purse, for example, tell the difference between a pen and your lip balm just by touch, without even looking. You can do that, can't you? I mean, those of you who have purses, anyway. Um, imagine your backpack or a drawer if you don't have a purse. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, with either having a purse or not having a purse. But, you know, you, you've done this before. You can reach into some place and feel around, and, and you know when you've grabbed the right thing. That would be the somatosensory association area. That's not just registering, you know, the the, the shape. Uh, I mean, well, it's not just registering simple um, uh, sensory inputs. It's putting all the simple in sensory inputs together and, and merging them into an overall sense of the shape and the texture and all that kind of stuff. That's actually thinking, okay? Then the visual association area. So we saw somatosensory association, now visual. Broadman areas 18 and 19. So again, look in the diagrams there. You can see in the, uh, in the top diagram and in the bottom. Notice, where are those? Those are back on the occipital lobe. Remember, the occipital lobe is the visual area of your brain. That is where visual information all registers and where we think about what we're seeing. All right, located on the occipital lobe. Integrates information from the primary visual cortex, okay? So all that information coming in from your eyes, all right, it's, it's in primitive raw form, and then it goes here to the visual association area where we figure out what it is we're actually seeing, okay? It allows you, for example, to tell the difference between a fork and a spoon just by looking. You don't have to actually feel it. You can tell that a spoon and a fork look different. That's a visual association. Or to see familiar shapes in the clouds, you know, when you and your friends look at the clouds and, ooh, look, it's, uh, look, it's Godzilla, you know, holding a fork and eating um, a piece of pumpkin pie. Or when you look at the rabbit and you can see, um, look at the moon, rather, and you see the rabbit holding the bag of carrots. See, isn't that obvious? I don't know why people talk about a man in the moon. It's obviously a rabbit holding a bag of carrots. I remember I told my kids about that when they were still really young. And now when people talk about the man on the moon, they go, I don't see a man. I see a rabbit holding a bag of carrots. And other people say, you're crazy. And then my kids point it out. And other people go, whoa, you're right. It's a rabbit holding a bag of carrots. And there you go. This would be potentially confusing. Whoa. It's a spork. But still, you can, your visual association area figures out, damn, looks like kind of a fork and a spoon. Let's call it a spork, better than a foon. All right, continuing with association areas, the facial recognition area. So for humans, recognizing faces is such a huge part, it's so important to us, and it actually is important to other animals as well. A lot of studies have shown like ravens, which are pretty smart birds, ravens recognize people. If they see you and you know, a bunch of times and then they don't see you for a while and then you come back again, they recognize that it's you. So it's not just humans that have a facial recognition area. Broadman area is 20, 21, and 37. Look on the brain, look around. You can see in the lower one, you can see 37 standing out there. You can see 20, 21. Um, so this is where you take information, you know, for simple visual information, and you put it together and you go, oh my God, that's my ex-girlfriend. I better uh, quick walk the other way. Um, located on the temporal lobe, stores information about faces. 
usually more active in the non-dominant hemisphere. Here's a little bit of actual lateralization, all right? This tends to be more active on your non-dominant side. It allows you to recognize people you know or you've seen before, all right? So that, and again, think in terms of survival. Again, you know, it's important to know, you know, whether or not someone approaching you tonight is a stranger or someone you know, or your ex-girlfriend. Um, in that case, she might be coming to kill you. You never know. Um, visual agnosia, inability to recognize familiar f objects. So sometimes after a stroke or after brain trauma, people lose their ability to recognize familiar things. That's called visual agnosia. Results from damage to the visual association area. Prosopagnosia is the inability to recognize familiar faces. And it also results from damage, in, in this case, not specifically facial, not just visual. So look at the bottom left there, cool diagram. Um, this is the kind of thing they use um, to help diagnose visual agnosia. So you can see the responses A and B of two people who had visual agnosia looking at these things and trying to figure out what they are. And the person looking at an acorn says it's a coconut. Looking at an octopus, they say it's a spider. They didn't know what the hell the volcano thing was. I'm not sure I would either. Look at They look at a harmonic and say it's a cash register. Can't you see how there's sort of a similarity there? I mean, you can tell. You know what it is. But can't you see how, if there were damage, you would see those things as similar? A coconut and an acorn are kind of similar. A spider and an octopus. Then look at the person on the right, just slightly different things. A pretzel, they say, is a snake. Harmonica is a stereo or a computer. A mushroom is a lamp. And the octopus is a bug. That's visual agnosia. You still have, you know, some parts are still partly working. It's just you can't narrow them down anymore. And then prosopagnosia. This is really cool. Um, there is a, a neurologist named Oliver Sacks. He practiced in New York City. And he was a very gifted scientist and medical doctor. And he was also just a gifted writer. And he wrote many, many books that are really entertaining. I highly recommend them. But one of his best known books is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. So she had prosopagnosia and some visual agnosia. And when looking at pictures, uh, he could not tell the difference between his wife and a hat. So Oliver Sacks, by the way, there was a movie uh, made uh, called Awakenings with Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. I don't ever see that movie. But that was all about uh, um, Dr. Oliver Sacks. He was played by Robin Williams in the movie. So gifted writer, um, cool guy, famous neurologist. You should read um, his books. You would enjoy it. The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat is an incredibly entertaining book, and you'll also learn a whole lot about the brain by reading that book. Okay, so continuing with association areas, the auditory association area. We looked at visual association, now auditory. So this is Broadman Area 22. You can see it back there, located on the temporal lobe again. Integrates input from the primary auditory cortex. So this includes Wernicke's area, which interprets language. I mentioned this earlier. There is Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and we will come back to them again. But Wernicke's area is where you understand what it is you're hearing. When somebody talks to you, your ability to make sense out of what they're saying, that's happening here in Broadman Area 22. It allows you to identify different voices. So, you know, even, you know, for in... You know, somebody in another room, you hear a voice and you go, oh my God, that's, that's grandma. You know, um, you recognize voices and that's where this is happening. Or to tell the difference between thunder and a jet airplane. Both of them make kind of a rumbling noise in the sky, but normally you can tell the difference between those two. That's your auditory association area, being able to identify distinct sounds that you've experienced before. Auditory agnosia is the inability to recognize familiar sounds, just like we saw with visual agnosia. Auditory verbal agnosia, inability to understand speech. And boy, that would be a hard thing to deal with, wouldn't it? We'll talk more about that coming up in later slides. Alexia, inability to understand written words. And amusia, inability to recognize or reproduce musical tones. So in some cases, somebody, we say they're tone deaf, that may be problems with their auditory association area. They simply can't tell the difference between different tones. And alexia, a, a language disorder, along with um, um, verbal agnosia. So 
just to show this is a place I go at the Grand Canyon every year um, spectacular place but it's funny one of the things about being out in an area this remote this is not anywhere near where most people go most people go to the north or the south rim those are around mile 90 this is out around mile 145 you can only get here by four-wheel drive road you'll need a good map GPS isn't reliable there's no cell coverage here but one of the things that sounds crazy but when we're in the city when we're in civilization we hear so many sounds we don't realize all the background noise in our lives but you get to a place like this it is absolutely quiet there's absolutely no sound except basically the wind and your own body movements and sometimes it's funny I'll be out at a place like this here you can see a big thunderstorm coming in and thunderstorms here are potentially a little bit dangerous um, because of all the lightning if you're up on a high point like I'm on right now I'm as high as those big high points you see in the distance um, you kind of stand out for lightning so if there is a lightning storm you need to take cover so sometimes when I'm out there and I hear a rumble in the distance I find myself thinking wait was that a jet plane or was that a thunderstorm it can actually be hard to tell for a little bit um, so see visual or auditory association area once again can turn out to be a survival type of thing.